in the, if you have your Bibles, you'd like to turn with me today. We're going to be in the book of Jonah. We're going to stay there. And uh, we're going to just reflect on some of these truths from this, uh, this account. If, if this is probably the only prophetic book that is almost 90-something percent narrative uh, within Scripture. And basically, it's telling the story that had taken place, but through this story that's taken place, it, it's bringing us a prophetic message. And uh, we need to heed what is being shared here. God has, in his providence, included this account within Scripture, not just so that we would be aware of historic events, but that we would be challenged, that we would be blessed, that we would be guided by these truths in our lives. And so starting there in chapter 1, it says, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm, I want to read the, uh, the whole first chapter to you at this time. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was likened to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and he was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and they said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, has done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, and they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Um, a lot of us, when we think of Jonah, we know verse one, chapter one, verse seventeen, and uh, a lot of people know one seventeen. That's about it. There was a man named Jonah. He was cast into the sea. He was swallowed by a great fish. He ended up in the fish's belly for three, three days and nights. But there's a whole lot more to this. I want to just take a few minutes and reflect on these truths. First of all, we need to see in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. This was God talking to Jonah and commissioning Jonah for what he would have him to do. I want you to know that God's word has come unto you. Just as God's word came unto Jonah, God's word has come unto Mark, and God's word has come unto Seth, and God's word has come unto Olivia. God's word has come unto all of you. How important it is, and we recognize this, and Jonah learned through the school of hard knocks 
uh, actually the school of whale belly experience, that he made the wrong choice initially in rejecting that call, in doing things his own way because of his own desires and his own interests, instead of submitting to the call of God and rendering unto God the service that he so desired. We need to recognize that the same experiences that Jonah has gone through are experience that we also will go through if indeed God has called us and talked to us and shared with us those things that he wants us to do. And we as Jonah, instead of submitting and surrendering and obeying, we run away from the presence of God. It says there that Jonah heard the word of God. He knew what God wanted to, him to do. In this particular case, he was told he wanted him to go to the city of Nineveh. He wanted him to share with the city of Nineveh about their wickedness and about the fact that God was going to bring forth judgment. Now, in this particular case, just a little bit of a his, historic setting. Nineveh was a seat of the Assyrian Empire, was very... Um, over overruling of the of the Hebrew nation of the Israelites Jonah did not want God to even warn Nineveh of their sin he wanted God just to destroy them he wanted them out of the picture because of all the pain that they had caused him and his nation and so when God was sending him there with a message of to make them aware that their sin was going to bring about the judgment of God Jonah didn't like doing it God's way. He wanted to do it his way because he wanted his results. He didn't want God's results. And so he went into a ship and headed to Tarshish. Now the key here is, and this is the whole point, it's not necessarily what God had asked him to do, and it, it's not necessarily uh, why Jonah didn't want to do it. It's the fact that God told him to do something, and Jonah chose to do things his own way instead of God's way. Does everybody see that? So he went down, he bought this ship, he, he, he bought passage on this ship, he went down into the ship uh, on this passage to Tarshish, and the key here is he thought he was going to be able to run from the presence of the Lord. If I just get out of this environment, if I just change this situation, if I just stop going to church, if I just pull away from this kind of environment, then I will no longer... I will no longer have this calling on my life. I will be able to hide from God. I will be able to run from God. And th what individuals have discovered is, is that you can, you can try to hide from God outside the church walls. You can try to hide from God in certain behaviors. But I'll tell you what, God will find you. You can, ne you can never hide from the Lord. Jonah was involved in an effort of futility as he tried to book this ship to Tarshish to hide from the Lord, to get away from his presence. All of a sudden, as, as this account shares with us, is, is, is that there was a great uh, storm that came upon the sea to the extent that the mariners who were very acquainted with the sea were afraid they began to cry every man under their own God. They began to beg for, for their deliverance. In fact, to the extent that they started to throw their cargo overboard to lighten the ship, to potentially salvage the situation. And uh, it says that Jonah, in the midst of all this, all the mariners were afraid, but Jonah was in the ship, in the side of the ship, sleeping. Now, this is a different kind of slumber. I've shared with people this, is, is that when the storms of life approach me, I'd like to be sleeping in the back of the boat with Jesus. You know, we know that when the disciples were on the boat and, uh, and Jesus was on the boat, Jesus was in the back sleeping and a, and a storm came upon them and uh, they were afraid. But the key is they're, they're, they weren't running from God, they were with God. And the, and the two differences are this, is, is that when you're in the raging sea and God's in the boat, there's no better place for you to be with Jesus Christ in the boat. And you can have a confidence and you can have a peace that all the, although the seas are raging around me, that when I'm in the boat with Christ, I'm safe. I'm safe in his presence, amen? But in Jonah's case, it was just the opposite. He had run away from God. 
And so he was slumbering in in an act of non-awareness of the consequences of his decision and of the other individuals around him that were suffering because of the choices that he had made. This Jonah, I tell you, it's a message for all of us because that, that's what happens. We, get, we hear the message of God. He calls us to repentance. He calls us to a relationship. He calls us to intimacy with him. And many individuals, many times, run away from that, deciding, no, if I do it that way, God's going to do something in my life that I don't want. God's going to make me not be able to do this, and I like doing this. God's going to call me over here, and I don't want to go there. And so we, instead of submitting and surrendering and obeying, we run away. Never realizing, almost asleep to the condition in our own life as Jonah was, that our decision was not of rebellion and rejection of what God wanted to do in our lives and our our choices to just do things our own way. It wasn't only hurting ourselves, it was hurting those around us. This is so portrayed. You guys in Teen Challenge testify of this all the time when I hear your testimony. You know, the fact that, you know, my decisions that I was making when I was running from God to do things my own way, you know, I, you were sleeping in the boat because you didn't recognize it was tearing the heart out of your mother. Or that it was breaking up your family. It was destroying your marriage. And you were so bent on doing it your own way, you were asleep to these things. Thinking it was just your freedom, you know, getting away, doing things your own way instead of submitting to the plan of God. Well, as as the account reflects, Jonah was awakened. Uh, They encouraged him to call upon his God and uh, they began to cast lots to determine why in the world. It, it, obviously, it was a storm that these mariners were not used to. It wasn't a common storm to the extent that they were wondering, why has this storm come upon us? They cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah, so obviously it was. Uh, they determined that it was Jonah was the reason for this, and they asked Jonah, what's going on? Who are you? Where are you from? He basically told them, uh, as I uh, make this a little shorter, he basically told them, he said, God told me to do something. I ran away from it. And the reason that you are going through these consequences is because of me. And so they, they, asked, uh, they asked Jonah, well, what must we do to, to get, get, get out of this situation? And, and Jonah brought this to their attention. He says, you need, to get, you need to separate yourselves from me. You need to throw me into the sea you throw me into the sea, uh, you will be saved because this is a storm that has come against me. And, it, and, and Jonah, of course, was prophesying correctly. Uh, this was a storm caused by God, according to Scripture, because of Jonah's rebellion. I want you to see this as well because there's another truth here that we need to glean, I believe, from this prophecy of, this, of, of the account of Jonah is, is, is that when we allow sin to exist in our presence the consequences of that sin affect us when we are unwilling to stand up for righteousness and to cast that sin out I, I've heard uh, many many times uh, in my years of dealing with in, in the teen challenge ministry of individuals that would call me and they would say uh, you know what I have a, I have a son and my son, uh, uh, he's, he's turned his life over to drugs and to alcohol he, and, and total rebellion. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, honor my, uh, the standards of the home. And uh, he, he just, uh, I tell him the time he needs to be in. He shows up at any time he wants. He continues these behaviors. He, he's, just, he's just living in total, complete rebellion. And uh, I have other children in the home. And uh, our whole home is going through the damages and the consequences because of his rebellion and behavior. And uh, my counsel, and it's not very well received many times, but my counsel is you need to get rid of him. I don't necessarily say it in that mode, 
But you, you, you need to cast him into the sea. You need to get him out of that environment because if not, he will infect you. He will infect your other children. He will infect your family. You cannot let that rebellion continue as it's going right now. It cannot exist that way. And yet many, and I've seen it, many say, you know what, I can't do that. He's my son. If I were to, if I, if I were to turn him out, if I were to call the uh, uh, juvenile detention or, or try to go through the court systems or do this, you know, well, they'll, they'll throw him in jail or he'll be on the streets, and they allow that to continue, and that whole family goes to hell. And many, many times, sure enough, those younger children are influenced and controlled by those decisions, and and, and, that, and they live in that perpetual environment. And I'll tell you what, we're, we're commanded in this in Scripture. Paul, Paul admonished the church at Corinth. He says, I, I'm telling you this as if I was there with you. A person that is in your church that is involved in that blatant sin needs to be cast out of the church. You remember that? It says he needs to be cast out for the destruction of his flesh. He needs to be turned over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Uh, if, if you read that in, in total context of his messages to, to the Corinthian church, you'll see in 2 Corinthians, he's, he's basically saying, invite him back in. He's, he's repented. He's turned away. He, he's welcome to come back. But I'll tell you, there's a point where a separation has to occur. And if you're unwilling to stand up and you're unwilling to separate, it will have, the tempestuous seas will have a, a, an effect on you and your life too. Take me up, cast me forth into the sea. The men resisted that. And as they resisted, what happened was is that the sea, the sea remained the same. They were still going through the same consequences because of Jonah. Does everybody see that? They were going through the consequences because of Jonah in their midst. The men finally took up Jonah. They cast him into the sea. The sea stopped its raging as Jonah was cast forth. It says there this in the, ver in the 17th verse as we see that God had prepared a great fish. Uh, there's people today that try to scientifically disprove the fact that uh, there's very few fish that... Uh, in that part of the sea that could swallow a man where he could exist in, in, in a belly for three days. And you know what? I don't debate any of that. All I know is this, is, is that it was a one-of-a-kind fish. As far as I'm concerned, God didn't necessarily prepare a species of fish. He prepared a great fish in his providence to do exactly what he had purposed it to do. And he, he swallowed Jonah, and Jonah existed in his belly said for three days now it's interesting to note if you're if if your view toward jonah is uh walt disney uh cartoon where a man is roasting hot dogs in a whale's mouth and you know the smoke's coming up through the little hole in his head um you're 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 uh, you've got the wrong perspective you 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 need to understand that this is a this this man is existing at this point in the digestive tract of a fish where all the things that the fish eats go, where all of the digestive juices are. This, this was a, this was a uh, um, not necessarily a pleasant place, at least one that you would choose to go on vacation. But it was there in, in chapter 2, starting at verse 1, it says that Jonah, while he was in the fish's belly, prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Now, I want you to see something here because this is something I think that we miss sometimes. The fish was not the curse. The curse was the fact that Jonah was involved in sinful behavior. That was, that was, the, that was the problem. The fish is his salvation. Without the fish, he's dead. Without the fish, he's drowned. Without the fish, he's gone and he's died in his sin. That fish was his salvation. I, I'll tell you, it, it, this is a great, uh, I know there's more people here than just Teen Challenge residents, but this is a great Teen Challenge sermon. Teen Challenge is not your hell. There's people that are saying, boy, I wish I, I, wish I, I, I didn't do these things, then I wouldn't have to end up at Teen Challenge. 
or I got to get up and I got to work. No, Teen Challenge is the fish that God has prepared so that you wouldn't be in hell. It's your salvation. It's not necessarily being in a fish's belly isn't always the most pleasant thing. Being in Teen Challenge isn't always the most pleasant thing. But it's the means, the means of, our, their, of Jonah's salvation. It was there while he was in the fish's belly, recognizing that God had provided a way. He was surely to die. Had provided a way to save, to save him. Recognized the fact that he had still had room for repentance, and it was there that he prayed. And I pray, I would imagine it's one of the most sincere prayers ever prayed. Um, he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and he heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And so Jonah, from the belly of the whale, prayed the mo one of the most prayingest prayers ever prayed, cr calling out on God and repenting. And I want you to know this, is, is that when we recognize these things in our lives, no matter how serious the situations have become or the consequences for, for our rebellion, for doing things our own way instead of God's way, when we finally get to that point in our lives and we're willing to call out on God and say, you know what, God, I give up. I surrender to you. It is you I've been running from. He speaks unto the fish and it vomited up Jonah onto dry land. So in verse 10, the means of salvation was the great fish delivering him from the sea and then the sea deposit, or the fish deposited him on dry land once again. And in chapter 3, it says, and the word came unto Jonah the second time. And so, Jonah was given another opportunity to be obedient to God. And uh, I want you to know that some may be here today that are living in rebellion, that have been trying to run away from God, run away from his calling on your life. And I'm not necessarily call it, saying that his calling for you is to enter into the ministry or to, or to join you know, the mission field, but his calling in your life is to be obedient to him. His calling in your life is to submit to his principles and precepts. And, and you have been running away, and you wonder why you're living a tempestuous life. You wonder why you're doing all of these things, and, you're, and, and uh, 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 yet, yet the storms are continuing to rage all around you. You know, the bottom, the bottom line is, there, is this, is, is that you need to get to that point and recognize that it's your behavior. It's your choices. And God, in Jonah's particular case, allowed him to realize this. As, he's, as Jonah calls out in prayer, God speaks to him a second time. Jonah just recognized that his, the consequences for, for his behavior was based, based upon his choices to rebel against God, right? Everybody see that? He did not want to do this again. What I've just been through because of my behavior, I don't want to go through this again. And so his response to God was different. His response was when God told him the second time to go to Nineveh, he started out. He headed toward Nineveh. I remember years ago there was a uh, Christian comedian who uh, uh, some of you may remember him. But he brought out this graphic example of Jonah showing up in Nineveh you know, splash, 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 walking into town, completely uh, white, died, died with all of these uh, whale's digestive juices, you know, smelling like decayed fish, all these weeds hanging over him. And, and uh, he said you can understand why there was such rapid repentance at his message. But, but as, he, as, he showed, as he showed up in town, 
uh, in, into Nineveh, and he preached that message that, you know, God is going to dis destroy you because of your wickedness, hoping that they, they would reject and not repent and that God would destroy them because uh, he didn't have a whole lot of uh, concern or compassion toward Nineveh. But it says the people of Nineveh believed God. And uh, here's another message. This is, there's so many messages through, through this whole small four chapters. And the message is that matter how much wickedness is in your life, matter how much um, you have done, matter, you, you can say there's no way God can forgive me. You don't know what I've done. You know what? My God's forgiveness is bigger than your sin. And God reached out to Nineveh and, and, and shared with them, there is still room for your salvation if you will repent. And, and the response was the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest even unto the least of them. The word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne he laid his robe from him. He covered him with sackcloth. He sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed through and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not, drink, let them not eat or drink water. And uh, basically, they just repented before God. And here's God's response to that. Verse 10, God saw their works and they, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do, that, do unto them, and he did it not. I want you to know that if you're willing to turn to God, if you, no matter what you've done in your life, if you're willing to surrender to him, ask God for forgiveness, you can calm the raging waters. God's judgment is going to be poured out upon those who reject him. We're, we're made aware of that. God's judgment, and you, you, might be, you might be sleeping in the back of the boat. Just thinking, yeah, right, it's not going to affect me. I got news for you. God's judgment will be poured out upon those who reject him. But if you recognize that the ways that you've been living, the things that you've been doing, have been contrary to the principles and precepts of God, and you are willing to repent, you are willing to repent, God will forgive you. What a trade. We give him our garbage, he gives us his salvation. We hand him our sin, he gives us his forgiveness. It's, it, to me, it's a, it's a no-brainer here. Why would you walk out of this place, or why would you continue life carrying those things that are going to pull you into the pits of hell when God's forgiveness is available right now? And all you have to do is you have to just surrender to him and ask for that forgiveness to be applied in your life through Jesus Christ. God forgave Nineveh. The story continues, and here's the, here's the, the next sermon, several sermons miss here within uh, Jonah. The next, it displeased Jonah. And basically he's saying, you know what, God, I knew you were going to do this. And that's the reason I ran away in the first place. I knew you were going to do it, and, and sure enough, you went ahead and did it. E exactly what I didn't want you to do. And uh, I'll tell you what, that we, we get to that point sometimes in our lives where we recognize that, you know, we want God to answer a prayer a certain way, but we, we're pretty sure he's going to answer it a different way, and he does. God does things his way, not our way. Everybody understand that? I, God does things his way and not our way, and we as Christians by faith need to accept that. We need to accept the fact that, you know what? As Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done, because God, you are in control. Well, Jonah was displeased because God did, did things that he didn't want him to do. He became angry. He, he went on a pity pot, started sitting on his pity pot, and simply said, you know what, God, if you're going to continue to do things this way and not the way I want you to do them, then kill me. Um. Take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Verse 3 of chapter 4. Everybody see that? Jonah went outside the city, sat on the east side of the city, made himself a little booth, sat under its shadow so he could see what's going to happen to the city. And, um, and the Lord, it, it, I, I once shared a message. I call it the gourd of the Lord. And, and you're, you're going to hear, hear that in synopsis right, right now. 
is, is that it said that here, here he is, he's, he's sitting under this, uh, this uh, uh, little booth that he made out of branches, and uh, God prepared this gourd to grow, and this gourd grew, and it provided a shadow over Jonah's head. And uh, what, what happened is, is, is that God caused a, uh, um, a worm <laughs> to uh, eat the root of that gourd, and the gourd died. And so uh, uh, the sun and the, uh, and the elements, all of a sudden that Jonah was sitting under the shade, all of a sudden it was gone, and Jonah was pretty upset. Uh, he wished himself to die, it said. He wished himself to die. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. And I, I, I'll tell you, this is so relevant. This is so relevant. I'm going to share with you the relevancy of this. Basically, the message uh, that, that God was trying to present to Jonah was this. He said, you know what? Do you have a right to be angry for the gourd? You know, the gourd died. Now you're hot. And, and you, you didn't have any compassion for these people. He says, there's a... Um, Thou hast pity for the gourd on which thou hast not labored, neither made it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, the great city? He said, there's more than uh, six score, 60,000. Um, actu actually, uh, a score is 20. So it would be six score. That would be uh, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And so he's saying, you're more concerned. You want to die because the sun's beating down on you. You're so concerned about yourself. You're sitting on your pity pot, and there's 120,000 people out there that need Jesus. What a message. We get to that point, oh, God, I need to die. You know, I just got laid off from work, or, uh, you know, I just don't have the bills for this, or I've got this health issue, or this is going on. Oh, God, just kill me. Take me out of here. I, and, and God, the message to you is, is that do you have right? Do you have a right to sit on that pity pot? When there are so many people today, even in your midst, that don't know their right hand from their left, they're, they're, they're heading to the pits of hell. And you know the truth. Ouch. We get so self-focused sometimes, don't we? We get so self-focused that things aren't going our own way and we forget about our facts that we're not here for us in the first place. We're here for God's glory and the advancement of his kingdom. He was trying to portray this thing. There's a lot of depth here in this, uh, just these four chapters of Jonah, but I hope we can glean something from this. If you're running away, it's an effort in futility. You can never run away from God. And God will someday get your attention. Jonah didn't need a second well belly experience. He recognized at that point, it's time for me to obey. It's time for me to submit. And... Uh, Maybe some of you are in the midst of the whale belly right now. But the fact that you're here and the fact that you're, you're, you're hearing the word of God today, uh, you've got a message of mercy and a message of salvation and a message of hope that if you are willing to repent, if you are willing to surrender, if you are willing to ask Jesus Christ into your life today, God will restore you. God will take you out of the tempestuous seas of your life and restore you if you're willing to do it his way instead of yours. And then I think the other message that we really need to glean today is the fact is that if we're whining and complaining about woe is me, whatever that woe is, we need to get off that pity pot and recognize there's some things that are more important than just our comfort. Amen? And the most important thing is, is that God's kingdom get advanced and that we submit to that.